All right, hello everyone. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to share the results uh, that of this project that I have been working on with several colleagues at Q and our institutions on the domestication history of the dead palm using archaeobotanical remains and hydroput sequencing. Uh, it is with great excitement that I share these results today, but also with great nervousness, because as few of you might know, I am not a palm person, but I'm I kind of an orchid guy mostly. But then, as someone that is deeply interested in understanding how natural selection uh, and artificial selection has shaped genetic diversity and genome structure, then palms is a, are an excellent group to work with. Uh, I personally like to palms because orchids uh, grow nicely on palms. I'm sure Bill Baker is listening to this. But then, uh, palms are also a cornerstone species of several ecosystems worldwide and also to humankind. There are uh, some indigenous communities in South America uh, whose lives depend on palm items on a daily basis. And also palm crops represent millions of dollars uh, in the economy, like the coconut palm, the oil palm. And of all the cultivated palm species, I think that the date palm, also known as Phoenix taxilifera, is perhaps one of the most interesting because uh, it is one of the earliest domesticated tree crops uh, that also played a key role in the subsistence of earlier Egyptian and Asian civilizations. And because of this reason, the historical record of dead palm cultivation across time is very rich, ranging from coin engravings produced in the Mediterranean to panels in Iraq. And also, this is reflected in the rich archaeobotanical record that ranges from charred seeds to all sorts of devices made of different pa parts of the dead palm. Um, we, can have a, we, have, we can see an example here of an item. Uh, and it's precisely this combination of uh, archaeological plant remains and high triple sequencing, as Professor Renard showed us earlier, that we can now have the great opportunity to peer into the past of this crop and have a better idea of their mode and tempo of domestication. So the dead palm belongs to the genus Phoenix, which has around 14 species that are distributed in Africa, Asia, and the Mediterranean. And to date, we don't know if these 14 species are good species, uh, but in most of the phylogenies published so far, we find that Silvestris, which is known as the sugar dead palm, is often placed as sister to Phoenix tactilifera. That you can, hear, see, you can see here in this diagram uh, the distribution of the closest relatives of the dead palm. Uh, it is thought that the dead palm was first domesticated in the Arabian Peninsula somewhere 7,000 years ago and then subsequently expanded to North Africa between three and 4,000 years ago. Uh, and then there is some evidence or recent studies suggested that actually the interaction of Phoenix tactilifera with other species that are not necessarily closely related to it were important in the diversification of this crop in North Africa. More specifically, with uh, Phoenix surface tea that is currently distributed in the coastal areas of Crete and some localities in Turkey. However, like the timing of these interactions is unknown because we are, so far all the studies have used mostly, uh, entirely recent material, uh, but also we don't know if Phoenix tactilifera have interacted with other species other than Theophras tea itself. And so, to address these gap, knowledge gaps, uh, the objectives of this project is, by means of comparing ancient and modern date palm genomes, is to disentangle the genetic contributions through time of other phoenix species to the date palm, and then to characterize and date the changes in genetic diversity that follow the domestication of date palms in North Africa. And given that we are living on a changing world with climate change, one practical application of this project is try to understand the impact of climate changes and domestication on genome architecture like past climate changes. Uh, this diagram summarizes uh, nicely how we are developing this project. We are at the moment sequencing up to one centimeter, one square centimeter of leaf material, mostly, from uh, archaeological materials. And then library preparation and sequencing is all being done at the same lab that Professor Renner is using, uh, the lab of Professor Hofreiter in Potsdam, Germany. And then uh, we are assessing the success of the sequencing of ancient remains by blasting all this DNA data we are producing against genomes of reference. In this case, it's the genome produced by Hasuri uh, of the date palm, which is highly fragmented, but is still useful. And then we are relying on NGS data produced for modern accessions that is already available in the short read archive of the NCBI repository. And we are taking this 
ancient data and this modern data, and we are mapping these against this genome of reference to then estimate nuclear, nuclear and plastid genotype likelihoods and call variants so that we can then produce PCA, conduct integration, harmonization analysis, and then place confidently this archaeological accession in a solid genomic and phylogenomic context. Now, if you wonder where are we sampling all these precious items, the answer is actually Q. We are sampling these items from the Economic Botany Collection, which has been curated by uh, Professor Magnesbit. The collection actually includes 500 items that are mostly of Egyptian and South American origin. As you can see here, a small taste of what the Economic Botany Collection uh, has. And actually, the representativeness of the Egyptian items of this collection is comparable to that of Berlin, if I understood correctly. And then, of these 500 items, 10 accessions belong to the date palm, which are exclusively preserved. And they range from seeds, bracelets, all sorts of devices. And you can have today an example of one of them, which is a headband. And that's actually the item we have sequenced, one of the items we have sequenced so far. This is super useful because these items represent a temporal series between 3,500 and 2,500 years old. So you can run all sorts of analysis should you have access to the material itself, the DNA. Then this particular item that we are presenting today is this, is this headpad, which, has, which is of late Egyptian origin and has an age of 2,500 years old uh, that was found uh, on the, near the animal necropolis of Saqqara, which is somewhere here south of Cairo, and is supposedly made of dead bumps. Now we are sure it's made of dead bumps, as you will see in a minute. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, for showing that. Thanks very much. And this slide summarizes uh, the success of our sequencing experiment. We produced 400 million reads, of which 70% were dimers, 29.9% was exogenous DNA, so fungal and bacterial contaminations, and only 0.008% was actually <laughs> real panel DNA. I know this is, sounds frustrating and so on, and this of course begs the question, that's what can we do with this tiny, super tiny amount of DNA? And I hope you will be surprised. So of this 0.008% of real PAMED DNA, 60% matched uh, the nuclear genome, 39% matched the plastid, and 0.5% matched the mitochondria. But before we go into the real business, for us to make sure that what we are really sequencing, what we are really analyzing is, in fact, ancient DNA, what we did is that we estimated the post-mortem DNA damage. Uh, so this is a typical signature that DNA extracted from all the environmental specimens that archaeological remains has. And it's basically artificial substitutions or misincorporations, better term for it, that occur towards the end of the reads, the three, five, the three prime and the five prime. These are mostly C2T misincorporations, <coughs> but can be also G2A. And when we compare these misincorporations of our ancient sample with DNA of a modern sample, you can clearly see that there is a lot of DNA damage towards the ends of the reads, something that is not present in, let's say, modern DNA data. And yeah, you can keep this for the questions. Um, then coming back to the question of what you can do with such a small amount of data, here is one answer. We were able to recover a near entire representation of a plastic genome uh, of, a DN of a date palm with a, an average coverage of 6x, maximum 20x. And of course, when you think of putting or trying to place this accession into a phylogenetic context, a solid phylogeny, is very useful. And that is exactly what we did. So then after aligning entire plastic genomes of other 35 accessions of Phoenix, uh, mostly date palms plus related species, we found that in this maximum likelihood phylogeny, that the ancient Sakura date palm, that object over there, is nested in a highly supported clade that is made of Phoenix Atlantica, which is a species that is currently distributed in Cape Verde. We don't know if it's a good species. It's often nested inside dactylifera, so could be an date palm. And all of these accessions are actually of African origin, and this clade is placed as sister of Silvestris, which is supposedly the closest living relative of the date palm. And now to try to understand what kind of phylogenetic history the nucleus, or genomic history the nucleus is telling us, we took the bits of nuclear data that we recovered, which is around 200,000 base pairs, and we, fair, and we produced a PCA. And what it recovers is that actually, which makes a lot of sense, 
that accessions of tactile and Atlantica make a cluster, and so accessions of Silvestres do. Then our ancient sample is placed in between these two clusters, and we are still trying to interpret what is the meaning of this. There is a lot of missing data, of course, and then the PCA could be biased, but uh, we are doing, we're trying to get more DNA data and improve this analysis. And lastly, to try to understand whether this particular ancient sample experienced gene flow between other uh, species of Phoenix, we conducted an Ababa test uh, with combinations of terminals of Silvestris, Dactylifera, Theophrasti, and Atlantica with a fixed outgroup, which was a more distantly related species, that is uh, Phoenix um, reclinata. And what we found is that the most dominant allele in all the possible combinations actually reflect what we know of the phylogenetic relationships of Phoenix, which is basically the Saquara date is more closely related to Dactylifera and Atlantica than to Silvestris and Theophrasti. But, and this is like the most interesting thing of this study, is that in one of the scenarios, we found that there was uh, an excess of derived alleles shared between the Saquara date band and Theophrasti, then suggested that our ancient date palm sample exchanged some genetic information with Theophrasti, at least that part of the genome of the Saquara date palm could be traced back to Theophrasti. And this is quite interesting because this pattern is actually not new. This pattern of integration hybridization between the date palm and Theophrasti was early shown this year, was published in 2019 by Flowers. Uh, but today didn't have a temporal context, and this is like the whole new thing of this study. If these results are solid, which we think we are, they are, uh, then we are placing, we are giving a temporal context to this hybridization integration event to happen. So to conclude, I hope I convince you that sequencing archaeological material is still, is still challenging, but if you are successful, the insights you can gain from it are really powerful, as we saw as well from the presentation of Professor Renner. But that then there are still technical challenges to be addressed, from uh, DNA extraction protocols to sequence data and analysis that need to be improved so that we can do a better job. Um, and that the Saquara dead band, that object over there, is more closely related to Dactylifera and Atlantica than to Theophrasti and Silvestris, but at least one small part of the genome of this sample is, belongs to Theophrasti, then put in a temporal context to this hybridization event. And as a next steps, uh, we are thinking on sequencing more archaeological material of Phoenix that we have here available in our collection. Again, all of it of uh, Egyptian origin. I'm placing it into a solid phylogeny, which we are also constructing in cooperation with our colleagues. And then we want to produce, for this particular sample, a better representation of the nuclear genome so that we can expand our analysis. And we think that instead of just trying a shotgun approach, perhaps if we focus on particular genomic regions using target enrichment, we will have a better chance to reduce um, the amount of exogenous DNA that we are getting so far. And lastly, we would like to use species distribution modeling uh, linked to the genomic data that we are compiling from these specimens to then to uh, least, uh, link this uh, to past uh, genetic gene flows, changes in gene flows and distribution regions and in relation to climate change and domestication practices. Uh, I would like to thank all our collaborators. We are a big team, as you can see here. This is just one uh, part of it. I would like to take, uh, thank especially Ilya Leach, Bill, Alex, uh, Susanna Ren for all the discussion and for encouraging me to get into this fascinating world of genomics and domestication. Uh, and I'd like to thank finally Professor Richard Benman, Yves Lucas, Susanna Renner, and Sioni for particular comments on this presentation and for your attention. <laughs>